Welcome. You've got digital folklore. Hello and welcome. This is another After the Episode discussion. So this is After the Episode for Season 2, Episode 4. If you've not yet listened to Season 2, Episode 4, do that and then come back here. And Mason and I will be happy to talk to you at that point. But right now, we're just not going to do that until you've listened to the episode. Yeah, we'll just sit here and we will wait. And we're back. All right. Hi. So now that you've listened to that, um, (laughs) Mason, from your perspective, how was it? um, Actually, we should back up. There there are some interesting things that you may hear as a listener that you never know why we make the choices that we make. Yeah. This episode was structured solving a very specific problem, which is that uh, both of us were traveling at the time, right? Yeah. I, uh, as we sit right now, and if my audio sounds any different, um, I am, I am in California and I live in Kentucky, so I'm pretty far from home. And Perry, you're I'm in Florida today. You're but, in Florida. Uh, yeah. I don't remember where I was when we recorded. Actually, I was at home when I recorded my bit, which yeah. is why we did what we did. Yeah. So I had uh, two weddings to go to that were just enough distance apart that it would have been asinine to fly out to both of them and fly back in between for a, for a few days. So we've driven across the country uh, in this this big road trip. And that has necessitated making an episode from the road and then starting the next episode from the road, but not having access to the studio and recording equipment. We decided to go for changing the way the episode was structured. Actually, it was your idea, Perry, to change the structure to accommodate when one of us would be around equipment. Well, and that's because we had done the same thing last season, right? If uh, people have listened to last season and... Remember the the one that was done like a film noir type of episode with Mason doing most of the narration. That's because I was out of pocket for a few weeks and we were just trying to solve that problem. So we decided to revisit that from a different way with uh, with me trying to do my voice notes like I did from the big mansion last uh, last season, but do that in a way that is kind of explaining my reasoning to anybody that finds those notes or comes along with that audio because I've apparently done something very, very strange in driving a Volkswagen off of a cliff. I like how you defend that that's not a strange decision. Uh, <laughs> Again, if you're in my head, it makes total sense. Yeah, and I mean, I live it, in my it, head all day, so I'm very defensive whenever you call that into question. And it, and it will make total sense by the time we get to the to the end. It was also like it, it works out in a couple ways. One in that I, I think it's fun to change up the format like that. On top of it, it's solving the problem. Yeah, I think I might be uniquely bad at finding music because that, <laughs> that I, I always seem to struggle with it. But but you, when you did Eighth Layer Insights, you always had you have a knack for finding the right beds. And and the uh, the second music track in this episode was one that I agonized over and found something where I was like, "This is, I think, the best I can find." And then Perry messaged after and was like, "Everything was good, but that one track I'm not a fan of." And I was like, "I knew it." Uh, and then I was looking and looking and looking and I could not find anything. And I messaged, I messaged you. Right. And I was like, I cannot find something for this. And you're like, well, here, here's a couple things. And yeah, voila, you found it. So uh, for the podcast producers out there, that was a track from Blue Dot Sessions. So you should go if you're not uh, using Blue Dot Sessions to solve your audio woes when it comes to music, use them because they slot in and everybody's familiar with that kind of documentary NPR ish style music. Right. I, I always forget about them because that is mostly like the vibe right of that catalog is is kind of that they were made i think that they were made pretty famous because this american life used a lot of their stuff Mm. and then um a few other like space documentaries and stuff but they've got some pretty dark music too that get used in true crime documentaries and stuff about you know murders and psychopaths and all that as well Mm. so that fits straight into driving a van off a cliff (laughs) right to back up to the production style of it it's simpler and also more complex because like you you gave the read obviously without knowing the music and then matching the music to the read is fun and it's also it's just really cool the way that music and spoken word comes together just in general i think because it it changes it like recontextualizes everything so like i had to i paste everything out without any music when i was editing down the track you sent uh and i was like okay this sounds really good by itself and then when you start adding in music you're like oh wait this is like the whole feel is different and then even just swapping yeah. out that one track uh can be the difference and you need to slide over your word gaps and everything else to make everything fit and then you have to figure out where your transition point is into the next track 
all of that fun stuff. That's a lot easier to manage on an underpowered laptop than the normal juggling of like 128 tracks or and six different projects like I would do for the, the episode just before Defying Convention. Yeah. So that was solving logistics problems. Um, so anytime you hear weird stuff like that uh, in our podcast or anybody else's, a fun question to ask as a listener is, were they trying to solve a problem? Were they trying to work around some kind of logistics? Or was it just an interesting creative choice? I think nine times out of 10, it's less around the, this is a fun creative choice that somebody wanted to try, as much as it is, this is an interesting creative choice that somebody wanted to try, but the reason that they're trying it right now is because they basically had to. It was the, yeah. <laughs> it was the best way to solve the creative jam that they were in and adding those creative parameters and limitations made them do something that they would have otherwise continued to postpone. Sometimes, and it's like not always true. It, 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 like, it, it feeds into that quote, limitations foster creativity, um, which is something I definitely feel for myself because I, I will be very pie in the sky and then all of a sudden it's due tomorrow. Uh, so <laughs> when, you, when you have that kind of a crunch or a limitation, it, yeah, I, I think you're probably right. Most, most of those weird choices are the result of solving specific problems. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it goes back to, because I, I hear other people talk about this in audio, audio journalists, especially who are out getting lots of field tape, will say if they get a piece of tape that would otherwise be unusable, but the content is necessary to the sto their story, they take the imperfection in the content and turn that into something that becomes featured instead. Mm. So it automatically becomes part of the narrative in a lot of ways of, oh, all of this noise that you're hearing around us is the ambience and the environment that really pulls you into the story rather than something that now you're trying to figure out how do I um, get enough noise cancellation, noise reduction to pull all that out so I get really clean voice. Yeah. And it comes down to this central idea of like trying to hide something is always and also, this might just be general life advice. Trying to hide something is almost always a worse choice than just being open about it and making it either special or just cluing everybody into it. Exactly. Then again, also doing this kind of thing lets you hide a lot of sins. Like I don't have all of my um, plugins and stuff licensed to the laptop I brought because that was an oversight. So I couldn't do some of the processing I normally would, but hiding those sins in the music worked. Yeah. Music covers a ton of sins. Yeah. Um, and, which is why a lot of the early Eighth Layer Insights episodes were super, super music heavy over tons of the audio was because I didn't have a good audio setup at my house. Um, but I did have an intuition about how to find some good music tracks that would work well and be engaging. To scoot us forward, um, what if we t shifted gears? I want to know what you thought of the interviews in this episode. Yeah. I was super, super pleased with the interviews for this episode. Um, Joel Best, I first learned about and saw speak at the International Society for Contemporary Legend Research meeting that I went to earlier in the summer and heard him talk about rainbow fentanyl scares and mm -hmm. Halloween candy panics and all that and learned that, wow, this guy that's, that's speaking just like three rows in front of me um, and was actually sitting on the same row just like you know, two uh, people away from me is the world's foremost authority and expert on Halloween candy panics. And then shed light on the fact that the vast majority of those are just not real. It's, it's people wanting to be afraid of something. And when you get down to the actual data, yeah, there, there are more hospitalizations and problems on Halloween night, but it's like kids with twisted ankles and getting hit by cars and falling down in ditches or it's not because kids are being poisoned. Um, and so it fits right in with a lot of the things that we talk about on this show is that a lot of that is is an urban legend or a panic that's been widely overblown. Um, and so having Joel there was amazing. Yeah. He has data going back to 1958 and it's just made he's made this one of his big career focuses. And it's and it's shocking to me always when when talking with people who have been like studying a specific thing like this for a long time. Uh, and and across some of the different things we've talked about, I am always and I think I went into this this whole project expecting to find more of an impact that either the Internet or centralized media or the centralization of Internet platforms. I'm always expecting to find that those have a bigger effect. And almost always they don't like with the Halloween candy panics when when Joel was like, oh, no, it wasn't even like it was circulated by papers picking it up and spreading it. You know, it wasn't uh, a centralized mass opinion thing. It was just something happening organically everywhere. Uh, that was a surprise to me. 
And I feel like I'm constantly being surprised at how much when we talk about panics and and things like that, how much of it really is just in our human nature on like a folk level and isn't as directly influenced by centralized pillars like media and yeah and whatnot. I was expected to be more. Yeah, I do too. Um, and Not to say there's a negligent effect. There's definitely an effect. I just always expect him to be like... It's really just, it's like scale, right? Scale yeah. and persistence and archivability of a lot of that stuff, I think, is what gets um, really brought out with the connectivity that we have. Um, but having Joel was amazing. We also learned in that episode that he was on an episode of Adam versus everything, mm -hmm. which was funny. And he got to be a pumpkin that was talking. Um, we'll have pieces of that in the unplugged uh, episode as well as what we put on Patreon at some point. Um, but that was a ton of fun to hear about because I thought that was that was an amazing connection. And that clip is great. And it's on YouTube. I forgot. To, I should link it in the show notes. I'm going to retroactively oh, yeah. go back and add that to the show notes. You should. And then... So I mentioned that that uh, we met him through the International Society of Contemporary Legend Research, and he was just sitting a couple seats away from me. In between me and him was Ben Radford, um, who I sat right next to at that meeting. And Ben is going to be on the next episode that we put out there. Mm -hmm. um, and Ben Radford is really the world's leading expert in a ton of things, from creepy clowns to chupacabras to the methods that people should use if they actually want to find real evidence uh, when they're doing ghost hunting to, to um, a lot of uh, COVID-19 panic stuff to uh, work that he's done around the interesting moral panics around Barbie. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's so, so multifaceted. We did that interview a while ago, and I keep thinking in my head it was multiple different people that we talked to. And then they like going back and reading the transcript and it was just Ben Radford. We covered so much ground. And oh, yeah. He, he knows a lot of stuff. And uh, if you want a, a forecast or if you want to get an idea of some of the stuff that Ben talks about, he has a great podcast that he does with a couple of co-hosts and it's called Squaring the Strange. And it comes at a lot of these panics and legends and everything from a, a, a very science-based, reason-based, uh, skeptic standpoint. Um, and not skeptic like the in-your-face, I don't believe in anything and you're stupid if you do type of skeptic, but a very friendly skeptic that is willing to ask challenging questions to try to get at the truth of something rather than just to be disagreeable. And I think that's what makes Ben great at what he does. Yeah, he could really easily like be a jerk about it, but he's super not. He's wicked nice and really approachable. And and yeah, and I, I agree. Yeah. I think that's I think that's what makes it special. And it's because he's there to, to to make a difference and to really seek truth rather than make mm -hmm. a point. And I think when you get somebody that's looking for truth rather than trying to make a point or one up somebody, then you get to fruitful conversation. Right. We're wired for logical consistency, which is not the same thing as being wired for the truth or craving. <laughs> exactly. Truth. Exactly. And then then on this episode, we also had uh, Elizabeth Tucker or Libby Tucker. And I had also seen her at the International Society of Contemporary Legend Research or the International Society for Contemporary Le Legend Research for the past two years. And she has done a whole bunch of great work into uh, college campus legends and uh, some of the, the really interesting things that people believe on college campuses and the weird stories that they tell. And we had her on our list of people to reach out to. And I was about to do that when I got an email from the head of PR at her college. And they were actually saying, hey, we've heard about your podcast. We think that you, we have a, a fantastic person for you to interview. And it was like amazing. It cut down my workload. Um, it <laughs> cut down my approach anxiety, all of that other kind of stuff. Um, and was really, I think, also validating for us that we're doing good work that's also being recognized because a year ago when we were trying to approach people, yeah. um, we were getting like no responses or people who were super skeptical of what we might be trying to produce. And they were they were just afraid. Um, and we had to spend a lot of time trying to justify what we were wanting to do, which is valid. And now we have people coming to us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is valid. The concerns that were raised were, you know, things like, I don't know what you're going to do with this information or how you're going to present it. And being a field that has been misrepresented in a lot of different places and a lot of different ways, it totally makes sense. But it is. Yeah, it was super cool to have people reaching out to us. Um, it's flattering, especially because like we're not folklore experts, you know? No. 
Well, and and that that statement Mason is referring to of, of the I don't know what you're going to do or you're going to take my stuff out of context. Uh, we have actually proven that we will, in fact, take everybody's interviews out of context and place them in an entirely <laughs> different context. But we are going to be faithful to the material and the way that they represent the material. So it's it's like, yeah, that's a valid concern. We we will take your stuff out of context, but we'll yeah, put it in the right <laughs> wildly out of in context. the right place for you. Yes. Yeah. Also, with Libby Tucker specifically, if anyone listening noticed that I wasn't there, you get a digital cookie. Uh, I wasn't present for that interview. You already have a ton of digital cookies in your browser. Yeah, but they can have another one. I'll just email me yeah. and I'll send I'll send you some JavaScript to paste into your browser. But you know what the, you should uh, do? <laughs> Everybody right now, you should export all of your cookies and send those to us. Yeah, that, nothing that's, bad will happen. Yeah, that's not a that's not a security problem at all. That won't that won't be a problem. And if you start getting emails that your passwords are changed, don't worry about it. But uh, cookies aside, I wasn't there for that interview with Libby. So hearing it for the first time was when I was putting the episode together, which was interesting. Libby's vibe, too. I wish I was there because she seemed just so cool and chill. Yeah. I mean, she's been at her college, I think it was since 1977. So she has a, a very, very long tenure. She knows exactly what she's doing as a folklorist and comes across with both humility and authority. And I think that it was it was really cool because you just hear the richness of her experience and her love for the topic. And then also the fact that in truest folklorist form, she's like, I'm and I'm not going to make a value judgment on people who believe certain things or whether certain things are true or not. I I stand outside and ask why these stories are so important to people. Yeah. Like Libby and Mark in the Wizard Tower is something I could picture of like going up to go visit right. them for like the two like one is the slightly more chaotic wizard and one is the like more laid back wizard. Libby has wizard vibes, if that makes sense. <laughs> she does have wizard vibes. And she was so laid back and humble and accommodating because I mean to to her, I I'm sure we're just kind of unknown nobodies <laughs> out in the out in in the world kind of um not really trespassing, but kind of, you know, working in this area that she has a ton of authority and credibility in, and, and we're very, very unknown uh, in comparison. So it was good, uh, really good to have her interact so positively and be so accommodating, and then also very complimentary of us as well. So from from your perspective, any other fun facts that come to mind about this episode, the production, the getting ready, the story creation or anything else? Yeah. One thing uh, that is fun is that a big chunk of the middle of the episode was written in a 2013 Ford Taurus going about 75 miles per hour through the desert with my laptop <laughs> literally duct taped to the dashboard uh, <laughs> and like my wireless keyboard in my lap. I, oh, I was I should be clear. I wasn't driving. And writing the episode, I was in the passenger seat. That was fun. The in the beginning bit about cognitive dissonance that talked about Leon Festinger's work. That was sort of a rabbit hole I had fallen down because the obviously the plot deals a bit with cognitive dissonance uh, in this episode with Digby and in, in other ways as well that I won't go into that right now. But I had fallen down the rabbit hole of studying Festinger a little bit, you know, as you do on the internet. And uh, it, it was just really interesting because he is not a folklorist. He's a social psychologist from the 50s whose a lot of his work was really foundational for some big elements of social psychology. Obviously, there's cognitive dissonance, but also he's really known for um, the proximity effect, which was this studying that they did to uh, show that the formation of social ties is more affected by physical proximity than uh, it is by like taste or belief or values or who you are as a person. Just being physically closer to people is a higher prediction of having ties and associations. I just thought it was interesting and then I had to cut a bunch out because I just I, I was making Perry rant about Festinger for too long. <laughs> and then even in the version I sent for you to cut, there was a bit too much. So I, I trimmed even more. Look at his Wikipedia page. He's he's interesting. Super interesting. He really is. And And when you understand how he infiltrated the doomsday cult, you'll also understand where cognitive dissonance comes in because it is super interesting how he really saw um, the fact that there was this doomsday cult, doomsday didn't come. Um, and then all of a sudden now all these rationalizations as to why it didn't come and how they were actually right the entire time fall out of that and really start to make sense. 
especially in today's conspiracy theory ridden world where we're seeing that over and over again. I mean, we saw that all the time with QAnon. Mm -hmm. With these really vague things and then people trying to, uh, whenever the thing that they were looking for didn't happen, all the different rationalizations that come out is they try to make sure that their worldview doesn't disintegrate. Yeah, reading some of the stuff that came out of that that Doomsday Call is fascinating. Uh, And that was in 1956, 1955, 1954 is when their prophecy was that uh, there'd be a flood that would destroy the world, December 21st, 1954. Where have we heard that before? We actually recently had something like that a few weeks ago in September where people were saying that they thought the rapture was going to happen and it didn't. And then you see the rationalizations again. It wasn't near as widespread. I think there was a lot more people talking about the fact that people were talking about it than the number of people who were actually talking about it. Yeah, you get two layers removed from it and then that's so big that it, yeah. Yeah, and that that's what it was. So it's it, because there's a few people that really believe this and then X number of that people talking about how ridiculous it is that these people believe that. And then people believe that, oh, well, that's the majority of Christendom or whatever that believes that when no, no, it's not. It's just a very, very, very small minority of people who were for some reason, I don't know. They were convinced. They're, they're convinced that, that they were right about that. Yeah. Hi, Matt Bliss here, background editor for Digital Folklore and the guy who gets Digby his snacks. There's a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the regular feed for this episode. If you're interested in finding out about audiobook voiceover tips, interviewing insights, and hearing some unfiltered banter from Perry and Mason, subscribe to the Patreon for a full six to eight minutes of content from them about the show and about what they do for it. And what? Oh, and Digby's a great boss. Did I? Don't throw things at me. I'm just doing my job. We want to ask a question of our listeners yeah right here we would normally put listener shout outs and reviews and stuff but we've not gotten any written reviews or comments since the last time we spoke so if you want to hear some of your comments out loud be sure to put those in in between the episodes whenever we do this so that we can pick some of the best ones that are there i have one. Oh, you do okay i have one it was sent to me privately from eli chambers who who made our theme music uh <laughs> eli sent me this we're in the middle of a jorts revival might well replace cellar door as the most beauteous phrase in the English language. Uh, if you remember from Josh Chapdelaine's interview, yep. partway through, he broke us completely when he was like, we're in the middle of a jorts revival. And uh, I'm glad to see that that resonated with other people, too. And I challenged Josh on that, though. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm seeing. I'm in Cali right now, and I have seen, I think, four jorts in the wild. Really? Okay. Which is not many, but I'm one person. Yeah, but that does mean that they're replicating. They're they're increasing in numbers out there. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to hear some some comments out, make sure that we get comments. We do every now and then get some some great things that are sent privately to us in email. Um, I don't necessarily feel like that we've always have permission to read those. But if you do send us something over email and you want us to make sure that we're able to share that out, just let us know and we'll share that also. But as we're talking about some of the more business and listener centric pieces of this, I do want to ask a question because one of our main goals and needs for this show is, um, you know, just honestly, at some point, we'd love for it to pay for itself and Mm -hmm. to to get to the point where. We're not continually having to put out more than we're getting back. And one of the ways that we can start to do that is by figuring out what other business possibilities do we have, which means that uh, we start to look at, you know, products or other things that we could sell. So and that's, you know, up and above beyond like birch and stuff like that, you know, like T-shirts and stickers and yeah, and those kind of things. Something that Um, like provide something we could do with the specific skill set and connections and whatever we have that provides value and also in in turn would provide us with a way to keep the show sustainable because we don't want to just load up on more advertising and because the, the money that comes from advertising is such a small fraction and right. it, it would be better and make more sense if there was something like one of the things we kicked around was uh doing a graphic novel adaptation where you have this like cartoon book of the digital folklore crew going through the adventure that also includes a lot of like folklore knowledge so like again that weird fusion of educational but also fun and silly but also that 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 would be that'd be a big endeavor to, to launch into and so we, i guess we want to know what you would want from us like what would be the thing that you think would 
be a really cool idea or really serve you or. Yeah, exactly. So if there was something that we were to create and put out in the world that we charged, you know, 20, 30, $50 for, you know, any amount, really, if you were to look at that and say, yes, I would want to buy that and I would want to buy that from them because I think it's unique and different than other stuff that I could get somewhere else. What would that be? We don't know. That graphic novel idea is something that we both kind of resonated with because I had a similar idea when we were starting the show. Yeah. But it was going to be more fictionalized with kind of like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but going through different folklore type things. And I may still write that at some point. But I really want you to. The ideas that were kicked around for that were so cool. Oh, that they are. It's just it's more anything, a time constraint that I have. Yeah. But this, um, I think, has some legs, too, especially if you have like kids or um, people in college that are wanting to learn folklore just to have this weird, interesting, quirky side route into the topic that really is reflective of the show and faithful to the show. But then also spotlights a lot of the people that we've interviewed as some of the heroes in that as well, um, giving quotes to them, giving them credit for the the perspective that they brought. I think that'd be an interesting potential. But but we don't want to go down the road of, of trying to um, throw out all of our time, money and energy creating something like that if if you don't see value in that. Uh, so we want to go after things that that, you know, that are going to have value. So this so basically kind of what we're doing is this is a meeting that you would think that, you know, oh, we should have with our team. Like, what does the audience, what does our audience want? What would they get value from and how can we provide it? But I think our gut instinct is always just to try and bring you into the conversation with us to be like, okay, what could we provide you that provides value and that in turn would help support us? So, I mean, maybe it's, I hope it's not gauche, uh, but yeah, I mean, it'd just be great to have a, if you have ideas or suggestions, like, you know jump in with us let us know uh you could talk to us ping us in our discord uh or send us an email hello at eighth layer media.com yeah exactly yeah. i mean just putting all our cards on the table and being vulnerable we're just trying to invite you to that kind of conversation because we want to keep this going and we also want to make it something you want so it'd be cool to actually know from you yeah and if if some of that is something that we did not even allude to but comes to your mind feel free don't be bashful uh, let us know what that would be next episode ben radford uh creepy clowns what happens with digby and his new conspiracy brain something else to look for next episode is any creative ways we get around the fact that production time on this next one is also a little bit of a pinch but it's not something we can structure the way we did this one so there might be a little bit of creative problem solving thrown in dum 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 but uh it's gonna be <laughs> right. fun there's a lot. We have all the interviews recorded. We have a general idea of what the episode is going to do narratively. Part of the episode is written. Part of the episode is written. The interviews are both in the can. D Digby is still in the rabbit hole. We're trying to figure out how to convince him that um, the conspiracies that he's held on to are not actually a thing. We're going to talk to Ben Radford, um, who is uh, just a wealth of knowledge, but we talk about creepy clowns with him. Um, we also have uh, an interview with Mick West, which is actually um, was such a good interview that I did in my first show, Eighth Layer Insights, that we're reusing pieces of that interview because he shared so much great stuff and it mm -hmm. slots straight into where we are now. Yeah, technically that one's going to be archival. It is archival footage. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Speaking of uh, desperation and not knowing how things are going to come together and merging that with the last thing about listener feedback and cool stuff that's happened, um, we did actually win some awards, right? Oh, yeah. How did we forget to mention that? I don't know. Life, life has been crazy. I've not even built like the graphic to share on social media yet about the stuff that we won. Yeah. But we won five different awards, two golds, two silvers and a bronze. Gold, we won best co-host team for an in for a pop culture podcast yeah which was a shocker right that was cool though that's like that's exciting i wasn't expected to win that one at all yeah g given the like fictional nature of the show particularly like not for any reason other than that like it just was not one i would have expected us to to grab because like a lot of the perry and me is is scripted and uh yeah I, well, I, and on the uh, the feature page for Signal Awards, it like had our cover. Now they they mix and match a lot of these on their feature page, but it had our cover with um, best co host team right under Red and Link from Ear Biscuits. And I was like, that's quite the comparison, right? Yeah. I mean, when that's... you're when you're being put next to because those guys have been out there for years and just 
kill it all the time. They also drink their own pee, which I'm glad that we've not <laughs> been in a position of like having to drink our own pee or each other's pee on a show in order to get some kind of recognition. I've been watching them since their Great American Alka-Seltzer road trip in like the mid 2000s. They have been a force on the Internet for so long. And I, I, I love them. Uh, and it is really weird to have seen their picture in that place. <laughs> yeah, but we but we won. Yeah, we won awards, which was really cool. Gold for best co-host team in a pop culture show. Gold and listeners choice for best trailer, uh, which is super cool. And that was the trailer for season two. Season two. The season two trailer, the VHS yep. trailer, which I'm really happy with. I really liked how that one, how we pulled that together. Oh, wait. No, I think the gold was for that 10 minute chunk of episode one. Of season one. Oh, it was for the season one tease. And then You're the right. listener's choice was for season two trailer. And we got silver for best indie podcast and then bronze and listener's choice for most innovative audio experience, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. So super, super cool. Thanks everyone for jumping on that and, and voting. You, you made us feel more successful than I think we have the right to feel, which is really yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, or I'm going to make a trophy for you, Perry. I'm going to make you one and send it over to your place. Or I can drop it off when we drive back through Arkansas. <laughs> oh, you're going to drive through Arkansas. We were in Hot Springs on the way down. Oh, you were in Hot Springs. I'm Perry Carpenter. And I'm Mason Amadeus. And this is Digital Folklore.